so yeah, you talk about REM, REM Cool House. What was that like? Um, well, REM Cool House um, is obviously a very confident architect, but he was in that meeting with Charles Jenks. And, you know, there, that was because the two of them were going to be doing um, one of the RBA evening talks. Yes. So everyone was geared up. Everyone was waiting downstairs and I just grabbed them and I said, would you mind? And I said, oh, no problem. And we just do these quick off the cuff things. But they were talking to each other, I think, partly because it was some of the discussion that was going to come up that night. And that's fine. Okay. And I wasn't really sure what questions to ask Rem. You right. know, you know, I love some of his buildings. I think some of them are, are spectacular. Um, and I think that Charles Jenks is a great writer and I love some of his landscapes, some of the works that he has. Um, and the two of them together were quite an unusual com- combination. So you're trying to interview the two of them in 10 minutes right before they want to chill out and go downstairs. So I felt I didn't warm up much there because they were, as I say, talking to each other as well, which is fine. But um, but I think Charles was the hardest one to get to, to get the answer I was looking for. Right. Yeah. So just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Angela did a series of interviews, many of them with the people, the top star architects in the world called In Conversation With, right? Yeah. So the In Conversation With series and she sat down with Calatrav and all these people and they are incredible interviews. Um, but yeah, I would find that really difficult as well because you're not just dealing with one yeah. kind of, if, you know, he's he's he, he's a theorist in some ways, Rem. So he's, he's coming up with his own yeah. uh, kind of thesis and, and his own principles. So you've got to be really, you know, that's something that if I was going to sit down, I, even though I know on the surface about Rem, mm. I would have to spend days kind of really getting into his I quite agree with you yeah. and I and I I didn't have the time no. to read the books in preparation and re- read all the philosophies and stuff but I tell you that the the most interesting one there were two there were two of my favorites was um um Peter um or Peter <laughs> uh, yeah. um he was just I could have sat there for hours I could have gone to the pub with him and had a great old chat love his buildings love everything about them just just I just think he is one of the coolest architects and then somebody else that I warmed to is the late since our interview of course um, uh, Charles Correa passed Mm. away and I met I I, you know I, I, I went into I've seen his buildings in Lisbon I had a personal tour of oh, wow. of the 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 most fantastic building, a place for the unknown. Um, been to talks, met his family, wow. and I just thought he was such a wonderful, wonderful man and such a caring architect. You know, he really thought about people living in summer, winter, spring, autumn throughout his building and how the building would change to suit the conditions. Mm-hmm. He was very sustainable. He really thought about about healing, for example, in in his medical buildings, or or you know how the family can help healing by bringing them in and having, for example, in the um, Lisbon building, the beautiful beautiful big conservatory so if you're having chemotherapy for example mm. you could bring your family in and sit and chill in a quite a comfortable place where where you will where you you will be helping the family and the patient you know yeah. heal quicker and faster and, and he donated uh, many drawings to the RIB right in your, in your time presence in digital format as well which he was absolutely <laughs> did and you know that is the first time that somebody who was either invited to um, to give their life works or if, if somebody was um, who themselves and he said actually that because he felt in in India at the time there wasn't the uh, conservation of books and, and a lot of them were drawings and all of that that he felt that the RBA would be the place to place them in safe hands uh, even though India would have been just you know different parts of where, where he was um, it, he just felt that giving it to the RIBA in digital form, that must have taken like months, if not years, to actually get together. He was so organised. Wow. He to have that gifted in that format meant that it was a real gift. It wasn't would you ever kind of just sort out there. Here's a bunch of files. It was all beautifully prepared, and um, a very generous gift. Very wow. generous gift, and be, and the drawings are fantastic. That's incredible. Yeah. That is pretty cool. And the fact that it's open then for everybody exactly. to get access. Exactly, it's going to last. 
that's what it is. And I was always about always about sharing. And mm. that's why I had the in conversations when I must have interviewed about 20 people over the two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also because I'm, I'm used to doing TV and interviews and stuff like that. So a bit like you sitting over there opposite me, mm. you know, this is a very relaxed atmosphere that we're in here, which is which is very nice. And you get much more out of somebody when they're able to chill and relax. And, you know, you're not trying to catch me out or I'm not trying to be smart arse. Mm. You know, it's it's about sharing knowledge. Exactly. And I think that th- it's the sharing knowledge for people who can't get to the RIBA to listen to the lecture and mm. the questions afterwards or whatever it exactly. might be. And just give them a little glimpse of a time, a time during that time, 2011, mm. 2013, what was going on. Definitely. And we can inspire people just from, you know, all around the world, every corner, every city, every country. And that's the beauty of you know all these YouTubes and yeah. Instagram. You you got all those gifts from Charles right during your time of presidency, right? You had a really proactive time in the presidential office. I must say, you, you got a lot done. Yeah, I did because <laughs> um, you know I was shocked to say, oh wait a minute, that was 2011, 2013, all of that in two years, which was pretty crazy. So I just want to get to actually understand your time and journey, really, to becoming the president of the RIBA. It was, I, I guess, had you always aspired to reach that position? I'm Never. thinking even, <laughs> even when you're a child, like, what were you thinking? What dream job did you want? How did you end up there? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's, it, it, I never wanted to be president. I never sought it. I was asked would I stand. And uh, a previous um, president um, had, had said, Angela, we'd really like you to stand because I had chaired Women in Architecture for five years. Um, from twenty to two thousand to two thousand and five, stepped in, you know, stayed in contact with Architects for Change, and we were trying to change the face of architecture, the physical face of architecture that is not male, middle class, um, and white. That it is much more broad. We were trying to open up our our, our group was fantastic, and it was people like Sumita Sinha, an architect, uh, Indian architect actually. She came here um, probably when she was about eighteen wanted to study architecture um, and it was, it was she asked me would I um, would I join the group and I said well you know I actually came here to complain that nothing was being done for women in architecture and Sumita kind of said well Angela you know you could do something for women in architecture you have all these ideas why don't you become chair and what year was this what this was, was in 2000 2000 so and you'd already been campaigning beforehand? What was your involvement with the RIBA before? I had no involvement with no. the RIBA, but what I did do uh, about 10 years before that, when I first came to London, yeah. um, I, I'd done my part one and part two okay. at DIT in um, Dublin. That's the Dublin Institute of Technology, now called the Technical University. I sit on the board there. Um, and when I graduated, I thought, you know, that's it. I just do my part three and you can work anywhere in the mm. world. But no, <laughs> no, I came across bureaucracy. You know, I had uh, I had been to Denmark for a year and a half. I had worked in, in Canada and I was coming back to Ireland. Still no work. So I said, I'll pop by London and uh, see if there's any work there. There was loads of work and a shortage of architects and there were loads of Irish architects. And we were hitting this um, kind of ceiling that was um, unless you're a registered architect, you can't call yourself an architect. Mm. Um, and we tried to get in to do the part three at Westminster University. And they mm-hmm. said, oh, I'm sorry, but you've got to have your part two recognised by ARB, ARCOC mm-hmm. at the time. So cut a long story short, we said we were in this catch two, catch 22 situation. We can't sit on the course to get the part three mm-hmm. because our course isn't recognised. It's recognised under EU. It mm-hmm. was called EU at the time. Um, or was it EEC? Um, and we said there's a problem. So we started a group called the RIAI yep. London Forum. And that's the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland London yep. Forum. And um, so we said, let's get together and let's challenge the system because if the EU says we're OK and we should be able to go and go ahead. They were holding us back unfairly. And we were just as as talented as anybody in the UK. And I would say, if not more talented, because we had a really good education in Ireland. It was a top quality education. Um, So the guys in Westminster said, look, you and Monica um, Dunn can sit the course and then we'll see if 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 your campaign comes through by the end of the course and you register it. And it was only because of that that we were actually allowed in to sit the course Mm -hmm. Um, we sat the we sat the exam passed, um, and then um, the slow EU was moving in the background, and we were the first two to sit the exam, pass, get our ARCOC um, registration in UK, oh, wow. and become architects, and then actually 
get a pay rise because wow. we are now qualified architects. So we try to change the system so that others wouldn't mm. have this trauma. And you did that through the through. RIAI. So through the RIAI. So then they asked me to sit on the RIAI London. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the, the RIA Institute, you know, on the board there right. uh, on council. Mm -hmm. So I was representing London architects. Mm -hmm. So that was good. It was good for contacts, for PR, for all of those kind of things. Um, and then, you know, I worked for Shepard Epstein Hunter. I worked for an Iraqi construction firm. I worked for GMW, you know, three different types of, of firms in in London and then went out on our own uh, with my husband. We had met at that stage, uh, Robin. So Robin and I started our own small firm. But but but, you know, campaigning, if you see something that's unfair, I will always stand up and I will always stand up for the underdog. And we were the underdogs. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is unfair. Let's fight it. And we, we won. And, and that was a marker. And then so then a few years later, I see the women thing. Mm. I say, this is ridiculous. Women aren't being paid the same as men mm -hmm. or women aren't getting the same opportunities. What year was this? Sort of? So this was 2000. And this was just just coming up to 2000. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was, there was um, it was harder as a woman to get a job. And certainly um, when I was at college, um, there was an unfairness of women and women were always trying to be weeded out. There were 10 percent women in my class mm -hmm. and they were always all the way along the five years. And we were all in contact with each other for five years, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the open studio, open, you know, to walk through studios and chat to people and help each other on different things. And it was great, really good, really good uh, learning process. But anyway, you would hear some of the tutors saying, ah, but if you were a man, you'd pass. Or why aren't you at home looking after babies? Right. So that or, culture is yeah. ingrained. And and that was I'm talking in, in the uh, in the late seventies yeah. and early eighties. Yeah. Um so anyway, that's all changed. Yeah, we're definitely gonna get into that. Yeah. I have definitely got, to, yeah. got stuff to get into that. And you actually then through these campaigns, through this kind of position you found yourself in, you started to progress you you joined the RIB, right? Um, join the RIBA because I think you should always join the uh, professional membership body that yes. you're in. So I joined as a member yeah. and then I was kind of working with Architects for Change. And then, um, as I say, um, I never wanted to be president. I never thought I needed to be president. You know, there was enough people. I was a small firm. They needed me. I was only my husband and myself and maybe four or five staff. Yeah. We were busy and um, it's, it was at the time an unpaid position. Mm. And I thought, mm, this crazy. is a big sacrifice. Can I do it part time? Could I do it two days a week? And I thought, sorry, what's what's uh, RIBA president? So how did you get the offer to do that kind of thing? Um, well, um, um, one of the past presidents asked me, um, I think it was a conversation we were having when I was chair of women in architecture. And I said, you know, you really should have more women presidents. Mm. And then Ruth Reed was nominated as the first president. Yeah. And um, I was directly after her, but it was during her presidency mm. that the preview, they always scout out for new presidents. Right. And I think I had quite a loud voice at the yeah. stage as uh, I'm not afraid to have a loud voice and always campaigning. And at this stage, you know, we'd done the diverse city and we'd gone to yeah. 34 cities around the world and we were kind of making moves here and we were pushing the RIBA all the time. Got to do better, got to do more for for black and ethnic minority architects and for women. So, so naturally you were the candidate. So, seemed. yeah, yeah. So so sometimes when there there aren't many other people, I had never sat on council. Mm -hmm. Now normally presidents come from people that sat there for many years on council. Mm -hmm. Although I had sat on the RIAI council for maybe twelve years on and off over a fifteen year period, I was one of the youngest members, and again I was invited to come onto that committee because I was representing London and had a loud voice. Um, so I think that. Um, when I was asked the first time, I said no, you know, thinking, no, I couldn't. I'm, I'm running a small practice. You know, I, I do I do all this other stuff, volunteer, volunteering and I'm on so many different committees. You know, I was on probably five different committees. And it was unpaid as well. It was unpaid. That's absurd. Now, today it's paid 60 grand. Yeah. So that pays somebody to sit in your chair. Mm -hmm. But I had nobody. Uh, so anyway, um, luckily I am still married. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I said, I will go for it because I knew there were two other people going yeah. for it after I was asked the second time or the third time. I said, look, I said, I'll throw my hat in the ring. But I said it will be under strict things I said I will go for three things. I will put forward procurement reform because the big boys were getting all the work and the small to medium or small practices, small practices being 97 percent of the profession, were getting an unfair deal. So here we were again. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to stand up for the small practice internationally in the RIBA, internationalising mm -hmm. the RIBA. 
was a very important thing because it was too insular. I felt it, we weren't looking for opportunities overseas and there was a lot of opportunities and a lot of skills in the UK, but it was very much UK based. It was like there wasn't enough work for everybody here and there wasn't, the, there wasn't a big sustainability message going out there. And I've always been very conscious of uh, the eco-friendly world that we need to have and how too many people were still building the steel and glass skyscrapers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, through the diverse city, I'd met counterparts in China. And I think that I saw that as a market. I had been to Vietnam. So I, I got invited to a lot of places you know, after the diverse city. So I was continuing this outreach then when I was president. So, I mean, I won it quite, quite, quite easily. I Mm -hmm. think I got two thirds of the vote. I went in and then I realised this is not a part time vote post. Yeah, this is a full time and it's full time, full on. A lot of small nitty gritty stuff that's in there. I tried to um, um, bring as many of my, I had a fantastic team, you know, good people like Walter Mentet and Ono Carroll and, and other good people that went up for election same time as I was going Mm -hmm. so that we could be a team and I could trust them and I knew that they wouldn't look at all the red tape stuff and we would go and say, okay, let's challenge this. Let's challenge that. Let's do something else. And one of the other reasons I was asked um, to to um, to stand was um, the Olympics. I had a lot of television experience and because uh, London had won the Olympics, and um, before that, I was on one of the uh, London Development Agencies as mm-hmm. their design champion. And I was always pushing the Olympics, pushing this great opportunity. And, you know, Olympics was very big in my family mm. because my dad was in 68 in Mexico wow. as a clay pigeon wow. ski tutor. And again in Munich in, in 72. So it was always part of our family, how great the Olympics was. And I could yeah. see this coming to London and I knew they wanted, they would need somebody. And what who could time? 2011, 2012? Well, was well the it was 2012, yeah. London 2012, the London Paralympics and, and Olympics. Yeah. And uh, this, this was a big opportunity for Perfect. architecture. Yeah engineering for large and small practices for, for our sure. landscape for our sus- this was going to be the most sustainable temporary, olympics temporary buildings 50 buildings, that kind of thing. 50 yeah. sustainable buildings that were all temporary Amazing. and had a new life afterwards and that was something that i had built on with the big team that was in the london development agency mm. when we were pushing legacy it's all about what happens after the olympics where will these buildings go yeah. what will happen to the queen elizabeth park mm-hmm. and it was lovely to see that all coming through they were very well thought thought through from the beginning and they brought it all the way through to what it is today Some so i'm of very those proud buildings of that buildings are amazing yeah the Wilkinson, uh, and then you've got the um i forget it's the the, the velodrome right? oh the velodrome by hopkins yeah beauty that's got natural stack, stack ventilation as it kind of kind of it's a very sustainable building up. it's a beautiful building as well yeah that is one of my favorite buildings actually yeah, and <laughs> it's yeah it's a pity it actually didn't win the sterling prize yeah. at the time because it was on the short list and i think that was a favorite by by a lot of people but during the olympics um again there was the uh, unfairness of the whole thing where the Olympic Development Authority Mm -hmm. and other groups associated with them said that only the sponsors could put their name up and say, I did that building. It was the architect and the engineer. It was one architect and one engineer who I will not mention because they've had enough publicity. (laughs) But the other 50 people, as I can show you in this photograph here, I um, put out on Twitter. I was an early Twitter person. I put out on Twitter come to the RBA 10 o'clock tomorrow. We're going to have a campaign. Hashtag drop the ban. It's still on Twitter. Hashtag drop the ban. And this was the ban that architects and engineers who had sweated blood to get their building that they were proud of on that Olympics. And they were they were blocked. They were banned from having it on their website, talking about it to the media, That's having absurd. it published. It was absolutely shocking. And what's the motivation behind that? Money's the motivation behind most things, but mm. I couldn't possibly say what it was. Um, so those were obviously, I, I, let's be honest, there's probably the sponsors wanting to have the kind of the glory, the, the, the kind of credit for that. And in turn, they would get the financial opportunities following it. Right. I don't think it was much to do with the sponsors themselves, to be right. honest. I think any opportunity, if you can afford it. Right. Now who can afford big money? to be like, you know, I always thought that when you have Coca-Cola and McDonald's as, as sponsors to sporting events, <laughs> something's wrong. Oh, so, yeah. so, 
you know, went from good to bad on certain occasions. Yeah. I think the whole of the Olympics was a great success. The yeah. Olympics and Paralympics. We must always say those two yes. words in, in together as a couple. But doing the drop the ban from a presidential office, I dropped the full name of the 52 architects and engineers. And it was done with Peter Murray, who was the London. He, he had the whole T-shirt done in, in advance. I only tagged on to his campaign, to be honest. But he joined um, the RIBA side mm-hmm. of it, as did the um, the um, president of structural engineers, mm-hmm. the iStruct engineers. And the three of us together led that campaign, dropped the ban. I managed to get a film crew onto the Olympic site, mm-hmm. got passes, arranged it. And I got all of these people to turn up over three days and I interviewed them in front of their building. Mm. OK, so this was banned, <laughs> of course. But I managed to yes, to persuade yeah. and get permissions, correct permissions in place. And we made this. And even when we were launching this short video of people standing in front of their buildings, mm. you know, really proud of their buildings. And why wouldn't they be um, like Asif Khan standing in front of the Coca-Cola building? Or we had uh, John Lyle in front of um, the utilities buildings. Then we had all the big buildings. We had somebody from Sahadid's office. We had somebody from Hopkins office. Um, Taylor, you know, the the project architects and then a lot of the smaller architects who wouldn't generally get a look in. Mm. But, um, you know, over three days interviewing everybody so smoothly on site, I have all of the archives. I've got something like 20 hours of film. It is the only film that was made of this very proud event. So that's a very special archive. I'm not saying where no. it is, but it's in safe hands. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> are you gonna drop and then, that? When are you going to drop that? And then we had um, we had um, the 10 minute video launched at the RIBA and I had to, okay. I invited everybody to come along yeah. and they tried to ban it. And I said, this is a private party. Get you out. are allowed. You may come if you would like. And we showed it. Amazing. And it, it just shows that there is a way of fighting big corporations yes. to give the proper recognition to our architects and engineers. You know, it's, it is your campaigning, which 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 strikes me a lot as well. And it, it's it's interesting because your campaigning now, I understand, is actually it was actually the precursor to even becoming RIBA president. Uh, and when you were the RIBA president, you had, uh, like you said, three things. But uh, in your final speech, you actually outlined five things. Um, have you read my final speech? I've been through a lot, Angela. You um, certainly have. So, but that's one of the things I want to talk about is one of your campaigns was the procurement reform and you mentioned that. So just for people who don't understand, what was the problem with procurement in 2011, uh, as you say, and what has changed? Because, by the way, before we get into that, just to let people know in sort of plain terms, procurement just means sort of getting the job right, securing the client getting the opportunities it's 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 how does an architect get a job right so what is the method that they have to apply for what are what are the uh, criteria that they need to be on the long list Mm. of applications to be considered to get onto a short list and what was the disparity when you were in office and and how did that change yeah for for many years um and with part of the eu procurement route which uk had to follow um, and still has to follow in fact with Brexit, they've just copied all of the rules, so nothing changes there. But one of the big things for the small to medium sized practice is that even if you're uh, an award winning um, architect's practice that's built lots of housing, for example, and then some of the local authorities, for example, are going to open up their lists and invite you. We are going to be opening up for um, all architects, all engineers, service providers um, for the next two years. Please send us your details. And we will see if we can consider mm-hmm. you for work. You couldn't just get it because you knew somebody in a council yeah. or you'd done something before. Um, so in a nutshell, the way to, to, to limit the list of 500 people applying each time or whatever, they will say you have to have professional indemnity insurance, which is one of the key insurances all professionals have to have. And normally you'd have it for a half a million pounds for a job that's maybe, I don't know, uh, five million or or ten no five million pounds worth of work or whatever, um, so they would put that really high. Right. So that was then out of the reach. So you'd read down the criteria and you'd know immediately 
ah, we mm. only have half a million or we only have a million insurance or five million mm-hmm. insurance. Only the big firms at the moment would have five million pounds cover each and every claim, all the detail that would happen or 10 million if you're doing really large projects. So most practices would have half a million. Mm. Uh, so they're cut out automatically or they would say you have to have done three of these types of projects before. So what about all the new guys that are really good coming through? They won't be able to yeah. even apply. They don't have the experience. So there were obstacles that were put in the way and we said this is unfair. Mm. The big boys who are not often doing the better work, mm. they'll have juniors in an office, mm. you know, churning out mediocre stuff Mm. as opposed to a really enthusiastic young practice who want to get ahead, want to have opportunities. These were being stopped. So we put out procurement reform as one of the big things I was going to tackle within the RBA, within councils. And so we had a lot of lot of meetings. We had a lot of discussions with people who were procuring. And we just we just felt that um, a lot needed to be done. Not enough was done in-house at the RIBA that I would like to have been done. And I think that was because it wasn't necessarily the priorities of somebody like the chief exec at the time or or some of the other people that work. You know, there's something like 500 people work in the RIBA with all the different offices. And I'm here trying to get my stuff through. And often people might think, oh, well, presidents come and go, don't they? You know, not the kind of thing you want to hear when you're giving your time full time for yeah. two years. You want people to work with you. So on procurement, I, I had a bit of difficulty getting it through there, although we did wake up an awful right. lot of people and we did make some changes, but not enough changes. Well, the awareness in of itself is what is probably the biggest part of that. I feel. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, as we've already identified, it's it's the people who campaign who makes the difference at the end of the day. And because it's now that awareness has been raised, I think it's in the hands of the people to try and make a change. But as you say, obviously, that it's going to that's going to affect the decision makers at the end of the day. Yeah. So we definitely helped. Yeah. Helped a lot of local authorities think again. Yeah. We asked for statistics to be published. You know, who who where is the work going to and all of and all of other things. So we, we. we made we made quite a lot of gain, but every president since then, so the last four presidents are still continuing, continuing with it, which yeah. is a good thing. Right. I guess it almost does show that there's there's other powers at play in some ways, because if if the president, if you wanted to enact a change, you would have to still go through certain other decision makers, right? Absolutely. I mean, we are only one small group, important group, but a small group with so many dozens of people right. that are all, that have all all trying to do things um procurement is one of the trickiest things anyone anyone could tackle and mm. it also sounds awfully boring to people who don't know much about it yeah so we'll move on yeah well that's <laughs> it getting the job is, is i know essentially. i know but yeah the other thing was is your kind of the internationalization of the riba which to me sounds amazing uh, for job opportunities and even studies actually and I have experience with this and I actually didn't know it came from the campaigns that you were kind of running is I actually lived in Dubai for far, four or five years. Um, we moved out there sort of when the recession hit. My parents' jobs had yeah. to shift. Great. But um, I was actually thinking after I came back here and did my bachelor's, I was thinking actually quite recently that I'd go back to Dubai and to try and work. But I obviously realised I need to do my part of three. Mm. So I was so glad to see that the, there are courses for the part three RIBA in Dubai. Yeah. And I know that's a part of the kind of international RIBA um, chapter, right? They have a good team. They yeah. have a very good team. They have a very good team in Dubai yeah. and they have an excellent one in Hong Kong. Right. And in Hong Kong, there were m- more people there doing their part threes, I believe, than there were in the UK. Wow. There were huge numbers just waiting for the opportunity. because Otherwise, they'd have had to have gone back to UK yeah. and sat at either, a, a, you know, a few short courses or, you know, gone back regularly. So that was a really good thing that the team there had had kind of sussed out mm. and it's still it's still going well, although they have a few local problems in whatever. Um but I think that the Hong Kong chapter were just so go ahead and wow. really So that seizing. was actually something that you came up with, the international um, chapter. I never say anything's down to me solely. Yeah, yeah. It was certainly something that I was promoting. That was your one of your main campaign yeah, aims. It was. What was the impetus behind that in terms of why hadn't the RIBA kind of established that early as a, as a as a main priority? Because from what I can see, that's such, that's such a crucial thing for us to be able, as you say, even in these 
crazy political, social, economical climate to kind of have that opportunity to think, actually, I could go somewhere else and use what I have, my RBA certification. I spent so much time trying to get it and money trying to get it and I can use it in other countries. Why? What was the impetus behind that? I reckon it's because I'm Irish. Really? And Irish um, have travelled ever since the early famines, you could say, yeah. or the uh, um, starvations, whichever way you look at it um, politically. Um, I think that because Irish have always been forced to um, emigrate mm. and, um, you know, the people that would have come to UK, for example, in the uh, post-war, say, from, from the late 40s, um, that would have been one of the first wave. They would have been um, labourers or they would have been um, factory workers. Um, the next wave were more advanced in their education. They would be carpenters, brickies, blockies. Um, they would have again moved up, so from the 50s, 60s, moved up. Then from the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, third wave, they were third level education. They got better jobs. Um, and then even today, there's still a lot of um, Irish people that are coming to UK, but they go overseas, they go all around <laughs> the world. Huge amounts in America, so Canada, Australia. Globally, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. And um, so so seeing the benefit yes. where people given an opportunity and I've been given fantastic opportunities in London when there were very few at home. I could have stayed in Denmark or in Canada or in the USA, but UK suited me. There were loads of my people here. There were loads of other people here. It was very diverse. Mm. It was very big and very welcoming. So, you know, I always say a big thank you to London for making my home mm. so, so, so comfortable in terms of, of, of my opportunities I've had here. Um, and then the Irish and the English are very similar, but culturally very different. And we must always remember that because people think, oh, you're all the same. No, we're not, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think I think that's one of the reasons yeah. I could see the advantage yeah. of ish internationalisation. But I could also see that our, the Irish are one of the best educated um, in the world, I think is the statistic that came out two weeks ago. Yeah. And they have got more third level qualifications than than most countries. I can't remember yeah. the exact statistic, the but it's pretty, yeah, it's yeah. pretty high up there. Um, and I think that, that knowing this and it's sharing knowledge. If we're mm -hmm. trying to make a sustainable world and we're architects and we're leading ha leading one of the main areas where we can make a difference, all the better. Let's go to China. Let's go into yes. other parts of, <laughs> of Europe. Let's let's go to Vietnam. Let's let's go to the Middle East yeah. and show them what we can do. And right. I think that's why I said let's get our people out there and disseminate the knowledge. It's Time is limited. You know, we have a small window of opportunity to uh, save our world. Yeah. I'm definitely the same wavelength. I mean, uh, you're talking to to, to to someone who who directly essentially benefited from that. So for me, I was... Now, look, a lot of people, sort of my generation, British millennials, are struggling to get on the property ladder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so that was the kind of motivation behind why I wanted to go back to Dubai because I know I can earn a bit more out there than I would probably earn here. Um, also because I would have personally been able to save because I have some family there. So... You know, I really had to move out of the UK or think about moving out of the UK just to get on the property ladder, which is, it, it, it's actually quite depressing. Um, but things like the international chapter that RIB started was was a great kind of blessing for me in a way to, to, to kind of make that move. And at the same time, it wouldn't make me, I was also very fearful that if I did move, I would kind of detach myself from the British architecture scene. But... You know, I'm still going there to get my part three, my RIBA, which is I would still be kind of tied to the UK, which is why I, I want to always be tied to, to home, you know. Well, that's good. Now, I didn't do this alone, remember? Yes, yes, There yeah. was a very yeah. good international chapter, so I just gave him a boost in a certain direction. Right. That's all any president can do. Yeah. I mean, you have to choose your campaign aims, yeah. right? But yeah. you obviously chose to prioritise that. Mm. Um, but it was very good because because of the diversity exhibition, I'd made friends and kept them, mm. you know, and that was there's a 12 year or, you know, between uh, two and 12 year difference when I was in when I was president of, of when I'd been to the different countries or when other of my mates had been to the countries promoting the exhibition and inviting people in. But the good thing is that when you're a campaigner, the door is always open. There's always mm. other people that are on the same wavelength, whether it be China or Vietnam or wherever it is. And they can understand that, um, yeah, hey, you know, you can inspire some people here. Let's make a link. 
let's do some swaps. Let's bring some of your people over here. Let's, you know, and that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's actually extending that outreach, extend, extending that friendly hand and saying, look, make these links. Yeah. And I'm always trying to twin universities and stuff like that. Building networks, yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. So another point of your kind of your, your campaigns was, well, actually, you stated that student support was a crucial campaign target. And you expressed your concern over the financial stress of raised tuition fees at the time, which we, we all got hit with, and the general kind of distress and exploitation that some students face, um, for example, in internships, unpaid internships, shall I say. So you, you gave your final speech in 2013, but actually recently, in March 2019, I'm sure you've seen, is we saw a huge controversy again with, um, which is kind of seems to be becoming somewhat common practice, um, where kind of these star architect firms are employing students on unpaid internships. Um, as you know, there was there was a leaked email campaign which was initiated by Adam Nathaniel Furman, who we actually had on the podcast, um, revealed the extent of that, the, the kind of manipulative practice where it was shown that, for example, Junior Ishigami, yeah. his firm required 13-hour days and six-day weeks. <laughs> So of the serpentine. Yes, and even you know, and and and, for, and even for interns to supply their own computers and software, um, that's absolutely shocking and yeah. disgusting. You know, but he yeah, but he wasn't cer- he certainly wasn't the only one. In fact, many many star architects were whistleblown on that. Um, and you probably have a lot of insight on this, I imagine, because I know, banned them. Yeah. I banned unpaid internships for all RIBA practices. Yes, and they're meant to, it's it's written on their certificate. Yeah. All in all, all staff must be paid at least the minimum wage. Yeah. And I was very particular about that. And we had a whistleblowing line. We had a whistleblowing line wow. set up so anybody could ring the RIBA and say, please check out such and such. But people don't. Mm. People don't say, oh, I'm going to report my boss. And then the exactly. boss says, well, how many interns are there in the office? Oh, was it you? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but 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 I think that um, People mustn't be afraid to stand up for themselves yeah. and say, look, you know, I've got expenses, I've got bills to pay, you know, I have to be paid. And if you're being paid for this work I'm doing, I'm being exploited mm. and just don't work for those people. I say, do not work and be exploited. Do mm. not work for nothing or you will be nothing. You will, you will have no value. Yeah. And I think that anybody, any practices that are still having unpaid internships, they they need to be reported mm. and they, people need to stop going to them because it's an unfair advantage. If we're in a competition and somebody else has got half their staff that are working for nothing and for free and doing long exploitative hours and I'm paying all my staff, you know, who's going to have put more time in to come up with come up with a design? Mm. Who who's who's the loser at the end of the day? Yeah. So those those kind of procedures are there are put in place. I didn't know about the whistleblowing line. That's really that's really interesting kind of resource that maybe some students don't know about now know about um, and I guess it was kind of depressing the fact that you I'd, as a student myself I never thought the Starkey tech firms would be doing that kind of thing I mean I could They're imagine worst. I could imagine a small firm you know who's really struggling you know oh, come on you know just do the extra hour you know I was putting in I, mean, I think it's quite common for all students to put in the extra hours why just generally I mean that's a good question why do you put in the extra hours yeah I mean we take it for kind of normal practice. But do you think that you've actually done any more at the end of a week if you were doing a 40 hour week or a 60 hour week? I completely agree. And that's again why you see a lot of these four day work weeks becoming popular in in Scandinavia, that they've done the research and they found that people who are putting in the kind of intense, focused work over a shorter period of time were actually being a lot more effective. Absolutely. And I don't believe that if somebody's good, we, we don't do a long hours culture. We send people home. Maybe three days in a whole year, somebody has stayed late. And this is your practice. This is our Bra- practice. Brady Malio. Brady Malio. And I'm totally against it because you are not more efficient. I don't like people to come in with black rings under their eyes because they've been working late. They, they, you know, you'll be falling asleep at your desk. You won't be efficient. People have got to got to have a home life. They've got to have life outside of the office. How do, As, we, how do we get people to do that? Because you see the same problem in university culture as well, where they're, they're staying up. You know, our courses now demand us to do all-nighters, which... Do they? 
Yeah, I mean, not 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 in a formal sense. They don't say, "Hey, you I know." To do five all are you not just yeah. badly organized? Admit it now. Are you badly organized with the time, or have you been given too much work? I I think. I mean, we also interviewed Eric Wong, who was outstanding Bartlett student, um, and he was kind of telling us about his work. And he said he only ever did one all nighter in his entire student, you know, his entire student life. So, I think you're right. I think. Uh, I know everybody does them. The we more did them in our day. Yeah, the more organised you are, the more likely it is for you to not put yourself in those situations where you need to stay up all night. Yeah, and you, you know, you procrastinate. You know, five minutes every ten minutes, you're going to end up doing no work. Yeah, and then you're going to have all this load put on you, and you're going to end up having to make up for it. So yeah, intense, focused work and organisation is key, but the culture itself is something which. Change it. You have got to change the culture, and students can do this. Mm. That lad, that that late night culture only came in, I think, in I don't know, nineteen seventies, when people thought it was cool to be doing really late nights and long mm. hours and all of this. But it's 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 rubbish. So we can't blame the universities for no. for putting out too like, difficult modules and you no. know it's not it, it negotiate is a, with yeah. them negotiate with them and say look. If you want us to spend so many hours sorting out these problems, looking at this, looking at this, mm. we reckon it's going to do a program, approach them and say, look, this is a more realistic program. This is more realistic. Spread out the projects. One of the problems I have found, and I've been talking to several students and I go to several universities around the UK, is students are given an awful lot of work to do. It's crammed in. And then towards the end of the term, from about April onwards, there's hardly any work to do, mm. and the tutors aren't even about. Mm. This is this is really bad management, mm. and I think that that is because the nine grand a year that was brought in, which I think is shocking, and I think it was a shame that the students didn't get out there with placards in the street and object to that and have that overruled. I couldn't believe it. I said it when I was talking to students at universities at the time: get out on the street I think and it protest. Must have been protests, yeah, but it, maybe not enough. Not, maybe they were not silent. Enough. You can't do it on Twitter. You yeah. can't do it on Facebook. It's not good enough you have to be seen if you're going to make a good protest but you have to come up with answers you know that's the the whole pain privatization of education and students pain has changed the way universities take in students and I think it really needs to be sorted and Mm. the current president of RBA and other institutions and the whole education committee and the way it's funded and everything it's just bringing mental health problems to students yeah. and mental health is is something you don't want to mess with you want to you want to have a healthy mind and a healthy body yeah. and uh, that's what's one thing actually when I was president of the, uh, you know a couple of years ago of the architects benevolence society that we championed mental health how to help students not get into the rut or if they're in a rut how to get them out of it how to provide free counseling how to help them with with uh, with benefit or whatever it was, with it, with with sums of money to help them mm. in in their difficult circumstances. But I believe that the mental health of students has been worsened by this whole debt scenario. Yeah. And I think, like in Ireland, it's free, virtually free. It's two to three thousand pounds a year. Wow. And I think that if you value your people, you will give them the best benefit to get the best education they can. And it should be as free or near free as mm. possible. If you value people, so any politician that stands up and says free education. I'd back them. 100% agree. That's a, I think that kind of then brings us on to another one of the most pertinent issues that architecture has kind of been struggling with, battling with, and it's one that I will admit I'm a little bit naive on. Um, and it's essentially women and diversity. Um, and this was one of, again, your main campaigns as president. And I've done recently a bit of work with uh, the Disordinary Architecture Project, which is run by Joss Boys. Uh, Zoe Partington and Mandy Redvers Rowe, who we had, she's a blind, uh, she's a she's a blind actress, author, and um, she's she's a, she's also a champion for kind of uh, looking at disability in a different way mm. and access in architecture. So I am learning myself a lot more. Um, but what I guess what is the main issue women face in architecture faced, shall I say, in architecture before and today? Because again, even today, there is a lot of concern that our profession breeds misogyny, and and like I said, perhaps because of our current generation of young students haven't really experienced what's arguably quite a traditionalistic culture. We, or at least I know personally, I can be a bit naive. So, what experiences have you had? 
with misogyny and what do you think still remains today or do you think I think have we solved this no we haven't and, and I look forward to the day when we have solved it but I think that's at least 10 years off um, things have definitely improved in the last 5 to 10 years mainly in the last 5 years um, in the workplace and I think that's because um, as people get older a lot of the uh, architects coming through like the O'Donnell Toomey for example you know world renowned architects they won the RBA um, gold medal the royal gold medal um, they're a husband wife team they're an equal practice. They've got um, good equality, good practice. And people can see, you know, when they see role models or they see Grafton architects to choose another Irish couple, world class architects. They are not the stark attacks, look at me, mm. you know, type of architects. Am I great? Um, they are saying, look at our architecture. Do you see what we're trying to get at? Do you see how the people move in the building? Can you see the sustainability of the project? So they, they, they have a different focus and people can say, I want to be like them or isn't their practice great? I'd love to work with them or, you know, and it's it's um, I think the focus is definitely shifting away from the male macho mm. um, star architect or architect or, or that, that you have to be an architect to be trusted. That's a that's a man. And I think that the more women role models that come through that are doing quality architecture that are, you know, Alison Brooks is doing quality architecture. She's got a great team. Everyone has great teams. Women seem to be the ones that admit to teamwork. It's always teamwork. And this is where the star architect comes in, mm -hmm. where people don't admit actually it's teamwork. Yeah. And they say, no, it's actually me. It's my building. No, it's it's the brand. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's one of the that's one of the, the problems. Mm. But I do think that um, that e equality, diversity, um, it's becoming much more globally accepted now as well. It's not just in little pockets here and there. You know, we live in London, one of the most diverse capitals in the world. Mm. We are very lucky if we were living um, I, I don't know if in Dubai it's much different. Um, I mean, I've met some fantastic women architects and engineers there. I've met them in the Middle East. I've met them in the Far East. Very talented women when I went in there because I would I would go in and I'd always, whenever I'm asked to speak at some event, you know, I would say I would like to go to the School of Architecture, please, and and see um, the end of year show or go in, call in on a crate or, or, or meet, meet in particularly the women's groups. Mm. And they were always great in showing me things. And you could see where they were influenced. A lot were obviously influenced by Zaha did. Mm. Um, and you could see this in, in the, the architecture that they were producing. But um, others were, were had other role models. But um, I think numbers are up in college, which is a great thing all over the world. But um, if we're looking at UK, um, numbers are up. There are actually more women, I think, that are, I think it's 55% um, women. If you look at in practice, now one of the reasons why women are always held back is they are the main carers if they have children. Mm -hmm. Average age, 34 to 36 years of age for a woman to have her first baby, much later than many other people. It's because people try and get the career in first, have babies before it's too late, and you know then do the nanny share or whatever it is. But then it's the way we live that needs to change because we're all trying to live in a nuclear family or we're trying to, uh, from the 1950s influence from America, and this is my own opinion, um, so that kind of had you out on your own, husband, wife and two to three kids. No backup. Parents are too far away or there's not three generations living near each other so granny can look after or grandpa can look after kids so you can go to work. It, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the way we live and now we're, we're trying to live back in cities. We're living in much smaller apartments that we can probably rent and um, few people have the money or deposit to put on by the time they have kids. So we need to relook at how we live and I think that um, co-living, co-housing, good models can work really well to help people not just architects, can help people have a better work-life balance, a better sharing of, of childcare and all of that. So it's not just mama living with mm. one or two babies over two or three years. And then it's, try, it's having the confidence to get back is one of the things we've found in our research, that it's, it's, it's women having the confidence to get back into work and we've found it works really well with, with our women architects that have had babies. They come back on a two-day, then a three-day, then a four-day. And sometimes four-day suits them. Over, over the next 10 years or whatever it is. So do you think firms, let's say the ones that do kind of fall into the more misogynistic practices, are you saying that they, they in some way are less motivated to employ women because they will end up having things like maternity leave? And that's what kind of creates the disparity? Because what I'm kind of after is, what experiences do you think women are going through typical of a misogynistic kind of culture because I'm I, I always I always hear about these things but I you know and I and I 
and I do understand that one of the, one way of kind of uh, understanding the evidence for this is, let's say there's fifty five percent females in architecture school, and for and let's say forty five percent males in architecture school. Is that then consistent with the work? Because it should be consistent. If you have that many people in university graduating, mm. how many people are in practice? We're about eighteen to eighteen, uh, eighteen, um, maybe twenty percent now. Twenty percent women in practice, right. full time. And then, if you look at partner level, it's still below ten percent. Wow. Although that is improving, you know. I didn't know it was that low. <laughs> yeah, just, you need to check those statistics, but I think that's sure. fairly accurate. Um, and then, you know, th- th- there's more and more people becoming partners and. You know, there's more of the millennial group now coming forward mm. to be the next. And that's, that, that will change again the statistics to be much more equal in probably five, eight, ten years time. I think women don't stand up for themselves enough. And I've, I've found that, you know, um, if you look at the statistics, um, men generally will ask for a rise. Women don't as much. So I always say to women when I'm giving my my talks, you know, my pep talks, ask for a rise, you know, ask, don't be afraid. Ask what is your what are the equal guys that have come out of college? What are they earning? You should be on the same. Don't ever think you should be on less. You know, yeah. uh, you're all doing the same job. Yeah. And all jobs in architecture have got a high stress level. There's no easy job, really. Of course. I mean, we're all responsible architects. We've all got to do our job properly. So I wouldn't say any one is more stressful than the other. Mm-hmm. Um. I think that as more and more women are proving themselves and women have to work harder than men, it has always been the way. My mother told me that when I was 18. <laughs> um, you know, as women are becoming more accepted that, I, hey, that's a good idea. And I find that when in all the committees that I've sat on, I've sat on maybe, I don't know, 25 committees over the last 25 years, you know, and you're on, you're on them for five and six years each. Whenever there is a, a better balance of women to men on those boards, you know, serious boards, good boards, um, I'm generally in the minority, maybe 25% women would be around the table, um, a max at 50. Um, and if you're not afraid, I'm never afraid to speak up. If I see something or I see a good idea or I say something or I back somebody over there that says, how about this? Or a little voice over there says something and I say, well, what did, what, what did Joanne say there? Uh, Joanne, can you just repeat that, mm. please? You know, to give people voice mm. is very important. And then, you know, there's always some bloke trying to claim that idea. You know, you, you get this all the time. But, no, but jo- Joanne actually just said that five minutes ago, you know. Um, and then, what were you saying about that? And then, then, and then there's a trust that built up around the table that actually everybody is equal. Everybody mm. does have a good idea. And then you will have a good working relationship on a good board where people trust and know each other and will listen to each other. And you don't have people vying and fighting for, mm. oh, my, my idea is better or anything like that. Yeah. And, and I think a good board runs smoothly with a fair balance. And the statistic is that when you have women on your board in business, in a director level, you do better business. Yeah. And that is a really clear message. Like as well. um, yeah. The, the, I think what I was looking at was saying that offices that have a higher percentage of women end up having a lot more successful business because they bring in, naturally, they bring in qualities which serve kind of a better environment, nurturing and those kind of um, kind of uh, that, that kind of environment is being built. But um, Absolutely. New opinions, new ideas, yeah. good networks, excellent at um, communication skills. Yes. Um, so together men and women make the best architecture or the best business so do you you do think that there are some qualities in general women have and there are some qualities in general men have Separate. i think you know this too <laughs> yes i i definitely <laughs> feel like that but but you know people have different opinions yeah but you, again you do raise uh, the point of equality and that's something i want to come on to as well is the definition as well that we use around equ- equality and people tend to kind of fall on on two sides of either equality of opportunity or equality of outcome because whenever I look into equality I keep coming across this this bifurcation of people who say we want equality of outcome and some people are saying no we want equality of opportunity and I'm still trying to get my head around it but what what, what makes me kind of uh, have a position is you know I think of you and you, you you worked so hard to get to your position you got to the highest office in RIBA uh, as president um, but that wasn't 
you, you you weren't given that job because people there were certain policies in place where they said no we need more women on the art ah, okay, okay. so put her in office yeah it was because you'd done all the campaigning it was because you went through all the efforts of having an incredible kind of manifesto to put forward and you worked your way up to that role naturally as well so i think what is coming up as a, a kind of extreme side of of of, of let's say feminism mm. is people saying equality of outcome should be prioritized over quality of opportunity well the opportunity gives the outcome for everybody 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 that's that's doing something or has had an education they've had an opportunity and their outcome will all be different yeah they w- it'll all be different of course. Regard- yeah but but it's who's looking at the outcome right who's looking at the outcome are they looking at a blind saying there's a really top girl here she's she's got a fantastic results mm-hmm and there's a bloke that hasn't done as well, mm-hmm. but I want a bloke, so I'm going to get him. But yeah. this woman's better. Well, obviously, that's completely unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, are we saying that is what we're trying to get rid of? That That's the main kind of issue when it comes to disparity and equality. It's, it's people who are mm. who favoured based on gender, mm. right? Mm. It's, you see, if, if it's for an interview for a job, as you know, you will go, it's, it's about personality. It's about how you would fit into that particular practice, whether it be small, medium or large. It's um, well, communication skills really will get you that job and you and confidence. That's that's that, that will r- rise above an awful lot of other things. Um, ability has to be top. Your ability to do the job, your skills, whether it be your, your computer skills and the drawings there, your design skills, your management skills, depending on how that's going to fit into the available slot that, that people are looking for. So I could interview or you could interview five different people and and you're not necessarily looking at the outcome. You're actually looking at that person that's just come to you Mm -hmm. and you're looking at something completely different. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really what you're meaning in this. Yeah, I mean, but I'm not going to say, oh, I have to have a woman because I've got nine men and no women. So that's that's the best way for us to go forward, because, again, I'm struggling to even (laughs) kind of define these things. But yeah. Or people say quotas. That's it's, not right it's, practice, it's the quota right? Question. That's not right practice, right? Yeah, the quota. So yeah. you, you're just going to fit the quota by saying. Yep. Yeah, it's up to me who I want to employ. Right. If I want to employ three women, I employ three women because I want three women. So that's something which you think is is okay. If it's for me, that's that's trying to balance my office. Say I'm a medium size office, and I'm thinking that I, you know I'd like a balance now. If there's any good women here, I might just I might just. So what if that. you have? What if you have? Let's say you already have a 70% male office. You need to kind of, let's say, as you said, balance things out. Um, and you have, again, a res- uh, you have some resumes in front of you. And you can clearly see that there are these, let's say, two or three men who have higher qualifications. But there are then these two or three women who they don't have as high as high qualifications. But you would you go for the women based on the fact that you need to fit that kind of... It's not all about qualifications. So you do agree that representation is actually an important issue to address. Oh, representation for me would be very important. Right. Um, but but it's but the representation I might prefer those those three women even if you were saying that they had a lower qualifications. But if they had a higher qualifications, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be going for. I might just say I want to get. I would like to have the balance of of three women because I think three women would add very good balance. They would add all of those other skills I'm looking for, and it's not about their their exam results. Mm. It's the personality. Will they fit in? It's it's all of those other things that makes up your your total round of office. Right. Yeah. But then wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you say that's unfair? Because if if that was to switch tables and a yeah. man was to say, actually, I want three men because I want to have a bit more of a let's say a masculine environment in here. Yeah. Wouldn't that be seen as no? I, 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 I can hear. I can hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um. It, it's very it's very hard to to judge that, isn't it? It is because this is again why they quali- I think because everyone's got different opinion on this, mm. and the fact is some people do see say that representation is is priority that we need to look at this in terms of representation is at the moment there's a there's a disparity in representation, so we need to prioritize bringing people in who wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity so i I understand these two points I was just trying to kind of trying to gather what what the position is in the architectural field as well because a lot it's harder in that I think that if I was to say I'm, I'm putting a board together yeah. I want to have a balance on the board 
I would have 50-50. So I would start off saying I want five blokes mm. and five women on my board and I would choose the best five of each from the applications. And then I know that I've got the balance. But I think that some local authorities do this quite well for their boards or whatever it is. But I think that uh, there is always a case for forcing representation in certain areas, uh, particularly if it's government, where, is it, where they can. You can't really ask private practices to, you can encourage them to, or, or big companies, whatever. You, but you can say big companies, large firms, uh, companies or contractors, oh, contractors have less women anyway, um, that's a bad example. Let's say you have, I, I, uh, let's say it's an awards thing. I'd say only people who have a 25% minimum women architects in their firm can apply for the diversity award. Mm. That's a fair, that's yeah. a fair thing. And if you've got 50-50, you might be getting more points on, on the right. scoring card. So you can actually say you're encouraging, you know, like in our exhibition, our exhibition, Diverse City, was open to black and ethnic minority architects as one of the lead partners, if there was a two or if there was more. Um, it had to be, uh, you know, based on, on, on completed projects or ideas for projects or whatever. So there was a, bod a body of work because you were putting up your work and then there was a personal profile of people. So you saw the work and then you see, yeah. oh, it happens to be. No, I definitely understand that. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was actually your interest in, so your avid fuse glass. Oh, I'm wearing enthusiast. a piece. <laughs> oh, did you make that? <laughs> yes, do you know, it changes colour when you hold it up to the light or if you look at it from the other And that's called dichroic. Dichroic yeah. glass. You have <laughs> been doing your homework. You've been very good. That's an incredible effect, by the way. It is. It's a great effect, actually, dichroic glass. Um, I put a few of them up on Instagram, actually, and it shows that when you turn a piece of glass, you can actually see the yellow or the purple, yeah. depending on the way the light catches it. But um, I always say to architects, do not just hang out with other architects. Right. Have have other people, you know, join a club, whether it be a book club, a skiing club, a, a rotary club, whatever it is, or art. And I think that most architects in our professions anyway um, are artists of some, for some form. I mean, I think the best architects are ones that can actually draw. Mm. They can actually draw something rather than just do computer drawings, which are always just square like that. And, you know, um, so I think. I think to explore your artistic and creative side, you should always keep it up. So I have always, you know, since I was doing art at school, I've kept up art and craft. I've taken a particular interest in craft. I've met a whole bunch of people I would not normally meet. And it was on Open House uh, 12 years ago. I went into Stoke Newington, which is around the corner from where I live in North London. And um, I went into the open studios and there was a potter and there was a glassmaker. And I, the guy there, uh, Richard Patton, who was a really good uh, glass teacher, a glass maker, and he does everything from uh, um, architectural installations, you know, whether it be glass panel on a shower or windows or big screens or whatever, um, down to showing people how to make uh, glass pots and vases yeah. and whatever else they want to make. Um, and I was so enthralled with this 10 minute talk. And I said, do you do classes? Wait, when did you get into the fuse class? 12 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And I've been doing it, you know, every month since. Well, that's really nice. That well, thank you. <laughs> that's something I'd buy for my wife. <laughs> um, so it's doing something with your hands that's creative. You're mm. meeting completely different people from all walks of life. And again, it's communication skills. Mm. It's contacts. It's sharing knowledge. It's if people are asking you about Oh, well, what does your job involve or what would I do if this or how can I make my house yeah. more sustainable or how much insulation do you need in your roof? And I'd be saying, well, what, what is it like being a medic or being a nurse or being a counsellor or or, you know, looking after your kids, whatever it might be. And it's 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 amazing. The people that, that I actually meet at these classes are a fantastic bunch of people. Well, that's the thing is, you know, being an architect is essentially being a polymath. You have to kind of get so knowledgeable I mean every project is is different especially in uni we can see that with every project you have to get so kind of you know in the know with different fields different disciplines you end up becoming a little bit of a you know enthusiast for let's say a month or two on a completely different field and that's again something I want to talk about is the integration of multidisciplinary fields in architecture and as we said you're extremely passionate about fused glass and um, being an artist yourself oh by the way the uh the golden bowl that you made. 
Oh, did you like that? That, that, I, that was my favorite piece. That was a All wedding those, present <laughs> you, you for somebody. That. I made that for somebody yeah. a couple of weeks ago for a wedding. I, I would love something like that because all those intricacies were really, really beautiful. And, you know. Sign up to the class, man. Really? Where, yeah. do, you, where do you do it? £25 a class for three hours. Stoke Newington, the one that I do is Rainbow Glass. They take six students once a week on a Wednesday. Yeah. Um, they do Saturday courses. They do jewellery courses. They do general Amazing. fuse glass. But yeah, I think that um, my love of art and craft, my mum is an artist, okay? My dad was a medic. Okay. But art has always been in our house. It's, it's always, you know, all of our art was always on the walls and we had great encouragement to keep it up. You mm. know, all of us paint or do something um, and when I was doing for example some of um, my our, our hospital projects UKSH is one of our clients and um, in that particular hospital I said you know you really need some art and they didn't have the big budget to commission but I said look in the meanwhile use how about I knock up something and if you like it we can put it up and so, so I did a kind of a, a rough rough up of you know a six painting thing and I said I could do something like this for you for one of your walls and she said I love it how about that wall and she pointed to a two story high wall and that's why I kind of gave a gulp and I said <laughs> uh, okay Maybe. I can do it yeah. I can do it I said I need it in four weeks wow. time so I'd spent four weekends in my back garden everything was painted in blue paint you know including the inside of the fridge um, so I just got, I got, I got, you know, uh, 30 canvases, one meter by one meter. 15 were for this one particular piece. So it's five meters high, three meters wide. And I like to paint to loud music. And Rory Gallagher um, <laughs> is a particular favorite, played very loud and high volume. Oh, and it was, it was lovely to paint. And I think that because of my time in Denmark, and I, and I was just interviewed the other day by the Architects Journal for what's your favorite building? You know, the yeah. Amanda uh, Buxton one. Um, that uh, I, I chose the Arne Jakobsen uh, Aarhus Town Hall right. because in the Arne Jakobsen and Eric Muller but um, in Denmark architects used to design the light fittings and the chairs and the furniture uh, for special buildings and it was multitasking on all levels through art to craft to installations but lighting and you know influenced by Asplund from the Norwegian uh, um, courthouse, for example, you can see how people have been taking influence from the 19 late 30s, early 40s, 50s, and then we kind of got lost. Yeah. And then architects just did straight architecture mm. and very little else. But I think a good architect is one that can bring the light touch and the continuity yeah. right down to everything you touch, like a handrail, or involve other people like sculptors yes. or artists or good craftsmen or good brickies or blockies that, that, that'll actually do something of interest 100 percent. that's so inspirational as well especially for students nowadays to think that i mean i know this firsthand that people coming into the field of architecture studying it they they have a background of other creative skills mm. they'll have done art at school that have done something creative and even if it's not creative it might be something kind of based more on humanitarian things or they might be interested in journalism the fact is we're not just about putting up box buildings and you know simple structures we bring a lot more than that a lot more creative things and what i love is what i love to see when i see architect office kind of taking that entrepreneurial kind of stance of mm. we don't just do your building but we might do a painting for you. Mm. Or we might design some of your furniture um, and again with, with with Adam we saw that he's he's a freelance designer with an act with an architectural background so I think it's again it's very inspirational for, for students to think don't be afraid to to be multidisciplinary even in your projects yeah well also to take that a step further you know, architecture is a very good education and it's not for everybody. Yeah. But I always say, go to the end, try and finish. Yeah. You know, so those people that go in and say, I'm not sure, I'd love to be an artist, but my mum and dad says you never make any money. This is my story. Yeah. You know, I'd love to have been an artist. And my folks says, you'll never make any money yeah. as an artist, but just keep it up kind of thing. But it's the same with so many um, architects I speak to and a lot of artists that say, I actually studied architecture and I've gone on to be a sculptor like yeah. Holger Lanz, for example, who I've, yeah. I've made some pieces with. Um, wow. And I think that, um, you know, there's writing, there's writers, there's journalists. Lots of them are have trained as architects or even worked a few years as architects. You've got to find your niche. Yep. You've got to find your niche. When? 
you, you mightn't find it till you're five years on practice. Really? Or you might find that, you you know, you've been practicing doing other things. You've been doing writing or you've been doing different type of digital art or you might be doing sculpture as a, a once a week for a, a course or something. And you think, I know, I really like this. I could get into this. And you might just keep that up and then you might just go over to that full time. And you always, you know, once you keep up your, your registration, you know, you can still keep up mm-hmm. the architecture. Uh, you know, never give it up. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Definitely. Now, I know you love your politics. <laughs> your Twitter. I hate current politics. <laughs> well, it's a love hate relationship, isn't it? But your your uh, it, Twitter is just all politics, really. Is it? Yeah. Well, maybe it's <laughs> it just must recently. Be the times. Yeah, I think we're going through a lot of kind of turmoil right now. But no deal Brexit. What do you think the future of our profession will be like? Of our profession? Of our profession? <laughs> what do you like? If we get a no deal Brexit, our profession is in big trouble. Not only will we be scaring away a lot of our European and world architects because of Britain turning into, I would say, little Britain. Um, you know, I'm Irish, although I have a British passport, and I've always been recommending on Twitter that if you have a European. Um, passport, try and get a British passport or if you're British and you have a granny who is Irish or any other European nationality, try and get that passport Um, because doors close in and I see the whole Brexit thing as so negative and my first tweet out that I put out in June three years ago was let's not panic ourselves into a recession Mm. and I kept that up as my top tweet, as my holding um, Mm. tweet for um, six months to a year and then I thought hmm I think it's time to take that one down because we were and we were hit and all of our friends were hit with less work because of the uncertainty it's done so much damage to our professions you know all of our professions um, to date um, it's it's driven work away it has shelved so many good projects it's cut creativity it's sent some really good talent back to other countries mm. where p- people in Europe or, or, or other countries yeah. um, affected by it. And I think that it's this whole right wing thing, which I really dislike. Mm. And I think that, you know, London was a real place of opportunity and so many of those have closed down. My final word on it is I still hope that Brexit goes away, that, that you know, that we that we actually have politicians that come together cross party and say this is a really bad idea do we really need to bring this upon us upon ourselves it's a bad deal for business it's a bad deal for Britain It'll, it could cause the splitting up of, of Britain of the UK I should say mm. um, and I think that it's, it's, it's such a bad idea How would we cope with that as a profession? Because it, it goes completely against things like the, for example the international chapter for the RIBA that might take a, take a hit in some ways it's hard to say because I'm not I'm, I'm you know after I was president I kind of drew a line and moved on to other course, things I went in you know to the president of, Ar- of Arcus Benevolent Society so there were links there but you know you've got to let the next president yes. move on and move on and move on but my advice always mm. uh, to to you know to them and to uh, to uh, to anybody in our profession be prepared in Ireland you know for at least a year ago the Irish government put out, they even give a £2,000 grant to people mm. to help to prepare for Brexit, to help now to prepare for a no-deal Brexit. What are they doing here? Nothing. Nothing. They are so disorganised and I think it's time for cross-party politicians to come together like mm. they are sort of doing are, yeah. and that the politics needs to radically change so that it's not party-based. Um, we need to get over this Brexit problem mm. So that it becomes a a, 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 a remain. Mm. So that it becomes a remain, and that we come back to our senses and we just get this country back on the road with yeah. better politicians and more diverse politicians. Yeah. I think it, people are wondering how architecture will kind of be hit by this thing, and I guess a simple way of thinking about it is, you know, I'm sure we all have friends who are, you know, let's say not primary British nationals, primarily British nationals, and you know. I know people who are, you know, even mentally feeling really horrible about the situation. It's almost having a psychological effect on people of, you know, why are we kind of not wanted? What What's this whole thing about immigration? And, you know, why is that being prioritized all mm. of a sudden? And it, it 
as you say, probably will have an effect most definitely on 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 people's kind of employment situation because I would be very interested to see what the statistics are of how how many uh, what the percentages of let's say foreign workers in architecture offices forty five percent well there you go <laughs> that's a big number yeah wow some practices are really suffering now because so many people have got nervous and have gone home before other people all decide to come whether it be Italy or France or Spain wow. or whatever it is Portugal uh, I'm talking Europe here um that they they think that the rules might become strict because people don't know. And if you leave people in limbo and they're thinking about their future career, yes, they, they want to get on, they have to act. you know, and if they're feeling in an unsafe place and there have been all kinds of propaganda and stories and bad news and fake news and there's, there's you know, there's not enough positivity. We've got huge multicultural talent. That's what makes the UK so special. Mm. And that's what makes London, you know, I'm being very London centric here, but that's my best knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's backed by Richard Rogers himself in the quote we saw. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think we have got to embrace everybody and welcome them yeah. and stop all this this nonsense, mm. which is going to leave us way back in the doldrums. Let's hope it goes, uh, goes well. Um, just to finish off now, that's uh, I've learned so much. Thank you for that. But just to finish off now. I know you're incredibly inspirational. You came to our uni and you <laughs> gave, a, it was the reason I actually reached out to you in the first place. You gave a very inspirational talk there um, and you held your business card up in the oh, air yes. and you were like, <laughs> we have to use these and it was great, you know. It's you a got three second challenge. Seriously. Get I your mean, business card out in three you, seconds. You, yeah, you, you did a challenge and everyone kind of participated and it got everyone talking and networking and that's, that's beautiful. I love that. What words of inspiration do you have for the current climate of let's say students today what do you what pieces of advice would you give them i think you need to be confident in yourself that you can get through the, if we're talking are we talking architecture here yes yeah i think you've got to be confident that you can get through your course in architecture that you must not be afraid and be alone you must reach out to your colleagues and work together. If you feel your course is not fair in some way, you're being overloaded with work, then write it down and challenge it in a friendly way to your immediate tutors and then if necessary, go higher up. You've got to have a course, you've got to have advice and compare to other courses so that you know in your knowledge you're, that you're being overtaxed or undertaxed or that you don't, you feel you don't have um, enough work due towards the end of the year. Invite practices in to give you advice. Go out to practices. I've put an open call to Westminster and I say we will do crits of up to 10 people on a regular basis. They can come into us and pin up. And I think more practices are willing to do this. You know, we want to help the next generation of architects coming through. We want you to do your best when you're there and not go off on a course or be a, be a little bit either unfulfilled or a bit uncertain about mm. things. And we can say, hey, it's all right. You know, we've been there. We've seen other people coming through. I think don't just mix with architects. Look at what your engineers are doing and your work. Try and get as much cross um, cultural and cross um, professional tuition on real jobs. Try and, and do a pop in to other architects. But architects love to be called up mm -hmm. to come down and join a crit. I love doing the Westminster crits. Yeah. You know, I've been an external examiner in my own alma mater, which is DIT Bolton Street in Brighton and in the Mac. I've done Liverpool, you know. So going out to all of these different places is, is really good because I can compare then and I can bring one idea to another. As uh, Students can do this. They can say, oh, in Liverpool they're doing this or in the Macintosh mm. they're doing this. Can we try that? But always keep up your artistic hand. Your eye to hand coordination is key. And take up a class that's outside architecture. Wow, brilliant. You know, what I loved about this episode, talking to you and what I've learned is throughout this episode, and I guess what, what I've learned personally is your lessons on taking initiative, your lessons on your, mo your inspiration on making, taking action. You know, if you want something to happen, you go out and you make it happen. And I think that's we've seen that through your career and what effect you've had. And I mean, even, you know, you obviously responded to my call and, you know, <laughs> I haven't got any crazy accolades or anything. But, you know, let's say I did take initiative and you, you, you know, you graciously accepted it. So I think that's a very important lesson students need to think about as well is, you know, even as you're uh, you know, advising students to take initiative of their course, 
get involved you know if you want to see a change in your course or in, the, in teaching or in tutors make it happen and also you are all role models just because you're in college and you think you're in first year or second year, your role models to go back to your old school or to a local school yeah. and say, hey, well, this is what I'm doing in first and second and third year, you know, and, and then people that are thinking of taking up architecture, you can say it's a really good course, exactly. you it's know, opens your eyes. It makes you make the environment better. And that's what it's all about. How can we live in a better environment? And it's been an inspirational episode. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. Uh,